And perhaps more importantly, we'd like to thank you for the way in which you serve the country. You made us all very proud. So all the people here today are eager to hear from you. So if you don't mind, I'm going to dive in with some questions. Okay, let's, go, let's do it. <laughs> so here we are in Indianapolis, Indiana, just a few hours drive from the south side of Chicago, where you and I both grew up. And your journey took you from 7436 South Euclid Avenue to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> now, I suspect that along the way, there were women who mentored and supported you. Can you tell us a little bit about the kind of support you needed during your early formative years? And maybe tell us a little also about some of the people who did support you. Oh, you, you, you don't get anywhere in life without people holding you up. And I was absolutely no exception. Um, I was fortunate, probably go, grew up like a lot of folks on the South Side, where families and extended families lived very near. Um, growing up, we lived in an apartment over my great aunt, who was my piano teacher. Uh, and her husband was a, a Pullman porter, retired, so we had our elderly uh, great aunt and uncle but right below us. My maternal grandmother lived literally around the corner. My maternal grandfather, they separated, but he lived right around the corner from her. <laughs> and they all lived with some of my mother's brothers and sisters. So grandparents always lived with their, with, with uh, aunts and uncles. And then my father's family lived only five minutes away. We thought they lived on the other side of town, but literally it was a five minute drive from our house. So we grew up with this amazing extended family, you know, and we celebrated everybody's birthday and there were a lot of birthdays. So we were usually with one another, you know, going to church, you know, uh, participating in plays. We were around our cousins growing up. And when I think about that support network, my, my family and my extended family provided that. Though they were my role models. And I say that because a lot of young kids think that a role model has to be somebody far away, that it has to be the f former first lady or somebody important. But the truth is, for me and for so many people, the most important role models that you have are right in front of you. You know, they are the, the grandparents and the aunts and the uncles and the, the cousins and that support was critical. Um, and I had a mom, fortunately, because of my father's job, she st was a stay-at-home mom until I went to high school. And she wound up being, she and a couple of other mothers who were able to stay home wound up being the support network for a lot of kids in the neighborhood who were latchkey kids. So we come home for lunch to my house or to another friend's house almost every lunch and we, we were a gang of little girls that would come with our little bag lunches and we'd have a good hour because that was before they reduced lunch to like 15 minutes of gobbling your food down. Back then in the day, you ha actually had a real lunch period. So we'd go to my little bitty house. We lived in a tiny apartment, but there would be about seven little girls and we'd sit on the kitchen floor, we'd play jacks, we'd watch all my children. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we would complain about the day or the morning, how stupid the teacher was that day, what little boy was getting on our nerves, and the parents were there just listening, listening closely. And they knew when to jump in and when not to jump in. They knew when they needed to have our backs because something unfair was happening, or they knew when we were just complaining. But they knew we were there. Um, so I was fortunate enough to, be, to have parents who were there. And it wasn't just my parent, it was a community of mothers that were sort of taking care of all these little girls and listening to their issues and pushing them through. So it's those small ways of support that you don't realize until you're my age and looking back and, you know, I'm, I'm starting re to reflect on this as I work on my memoir because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about these things and I realize that in my little neighborhood of working class folks with not a lot of money, with not a lot of education, there was so much support just in the small things, listening, valuing our voices, letting us talk and complain and argue and ask questions and push. And I think that that kind of support 
helped me learn at a very early age how to use my voice to advocate for myself and, and for others. So I was, I was blessed in ways that I couldn't have imagined when I was a child, but looking back on it, it was the, one of the many things that sustained me and provided that foundation that has gotten me where I am today. We're so pleased that you are where you are today. And as I was listening to you, I was thinking back to my own childhood, where I was maybe two miles away from you. And um, in our neighborhood, we also had an entire neighborhood of mothers who made sure that they were constantly supporting us and constantly keeping an eye on us. So you couldn't get away with anything in our neighborhood, and I suspect the same is true in yours. Yeah, yeah. Jess. Well, we can't, yes. we, we, we can't take those, uh, those support systems for granted. Um, you know, it, 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 I always say it's not magic, it, it's the small things. Um, so when parents are out there wondering how to give their kids what they need, they have to remember, you know, kids don't need stuff. I never had a lot of stuff. We were, we were working class, poor folks. You know, we felt rich, but we just didn't have that much. Um, so I, I, I just want more parents to realize that it's the time in. You know, it's not the stuff. Um, my parents couldn't even afford to put me through college. We took out loans, they took out loans, but they, they didn't have money to give us. But what they had was that unconditional love, that time and attention. Um, and that, you know, that's the one thing even throughout the White House that we've been trying to give our girls through, the, through, through all of this, because our girls have seen the world but when it comes right down to it, all they care about is whether or not me and their dad are listening to them, whether we see them, whether they hear us. They could care less about what we do, who we know, what we've accomplished. They want to know, are we there for them? Yes, and it sounds like you were always there for them, still are. And it also sounds like your mother was always there oh, for you yes. and then joined you in the White House to help you there as Marian well. Marian Robinson. She went to the White House kicking and screaming. <laughs> she, she is so who you probably think she is. She is so nonplussed about anything. She would tell people, well, what did you do to raise Craig and Michelle, my brother? And she's like, there are millions of Craig and Michelle's. They're not special. You just never see them. We've got dozens of really smart kids in our community. They're nothing special. That's Marion Robinson. That's what we had in the White House. That's what me and Barack came home to. What? What are you doing? Why are you doing that? <laughs> so she, she definitely kept us grounded. And the minute we left the White House, she went back to Chicago. She was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> well, I want to talk again a little bit more about your, your younger self, because you have very publicly talked about your younger self. And you've talked about the fact that when you were younger, you were afraid that you might not be good enough, you might not be smart enough, that you might be disappointing people, that you might fail. And we have so many young people in the audience today who may have some of the same fears. What advice would you give them about how to overcome those fears and move forward? Well, one of the reasons why I share those stories, particularly with our, our young, young people, is that um, I want them to know that anybody who's been successful, particularly if you're a woman, and especially if you're a woman of color, a person of color, you grow up with a lot of doubts in your head, you know, that are uh, things that you hear, uh, you know, subconscious messages that you get from the society around you. Um, it is that, it's that natural drumbeat of doubt because there are people out there who are afraid of you because of the color of your skin. I mean, you grow up knowing that there are people who just decide not to like you because they've been told something about you because you're brown. So you always wonder, what are they thinking about me? You know, I'm just a kid walking around, but that person is afraid of me and they don't even know me. You know, if you just stop there and just think about life as a minority in a culture of racist people, <laughs> that's what happens to kids who grow up. They're constantly thinking, what, what did I do wrong? <laughs> you know, I'm getting up, I'm going to school, I'm getting great grades, I'm staying out of trouble because that's exactly what the vast majority of kids of color are doing. <laughs> they are getting up and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. 
and they're growing up in good families and they're getting decent grades and they have hopes and dreams. They're not in gangs, they're not doing drugs, they're not robbing and stealing, they're me. <laughs> I am the kid you're afraid of. <laughs> so when you grow up like that, you naturally have questions about your ability. Maybe it's something that I did. And How did you deal with those questions? How did you address them? You know, you, it, 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 you gotta grow up. <laughs> You know, and, and, and it is hard to deal with. It's hard to tell a kid, just ignore it. But you practice ignoring it. <laughs> you have to practice pushing through it. You have to practice a achieving through other people's low expectations of you. Because you will, you will have that. You will get it in your own family, in your own community. There will be people who will hold you back because they're afraid for you. They are afraid of what that unknown is. You know, so many of our parents and grandparents had a reason to be afraid for us, their young black kids and grandkids, because the world was dangerous. It still is dangerous. It is dangerous for women out in the world. So our parents and grandparents had reason to be afraid for us. And sometimes that fear manifested itself in telling you not to try, because they were afraid for you not to fail. So what you have to do is get up every day and just do it, <laughs> because here's the thing, there is no magic, I say this again, you, you all are smart enough and you know, you're capable enough, and by doing and pushing and raising your hand in class and getting your homework done and asking teachers questions and working hard and persevering and applying to college and going to college and sitting around board seats and accepting jobs and starting stuff and failing a little bit, you learn that you're just as smart, mo oftentimes smarter, than the people who, you were, who were doubting you. And you only learn that by doing it. And now that I am 54 years old, I have worked in every sector. I mean, you heard my resume. I have been in corporate law. I've worked for city government. I've run a nonprofit organization. I have worked in a university, I've worked at a medical center, I've been the first lady of the United States, I've been at all the tables, <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> I've seen it, I've seen affirmative action in all forms, not just race, but money, prestige, legacy, it exists everywhere. It's just a problem when it's us, <laughs> but it's out there. And there are very mediocre people out there who run stuff. <laughs> There are people who are very mediocre out there who are in charge of things. But nobody has told them that they can't. <laughs> so they have nothing stopping them. You're just as capable. I'm telling you, if there was other, another message for me to give you, like, ooh, no, no, these people are really smart, I would tell you, they're not that smart. <laughs> so go to college, get your education, and, and put yourself in the game. You have to put yourself in the game and you don't do that without being prepared. But you can't be at the table if you're not prepared. Don't even, don't even pretend. If you're not educated, if you don't have information, if you're not on time, if you're not responsible, if you're not accountable, you, you won't have a chance. But if you do those things, which everybody has the ability to do, then you will succeed at those tables. You will fail too, but you will also succeed and you will learn that you were, you were able, you were more than able. So just put the work in. I guess that's my advice to you. Put the work in and don't stop yourself before you even try. Well, you certainly put your share of the work in. And um, when you wound your way to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, you went to the White House and opened it up in such an extraordinary way. It truly became the people's house. And you modernized the role of the First Lady. Why did you decide to engage in so many ordinary activities for the rest of the world to see? It, it, it's probably because of my perspective on life being the kid who often, and there are many kids, it's not just kids of color, but kids, it, it's, it's uh, socioeconomic, working class kids, kids who are always on the other side of the fence of the White House. And I do mean that literally, because one of the things, you, you know, we, can, we could, couldn't go far 
when we lived in the bubble of the White House. <laughs> An excursion outside required hundreds of men talking into their wrist and block traffic, and it was just a hassle. So, but some of the outside time we could get was standing on the Truman balcony, which overlooks the South Lawn. And just beyond the gate, often the tourists come and they take pictures. They're also on the north side. And you look there and you, a lot of times I'd spend time looking and just thinking, wow, those folks are lined up looking and wondering what's going on in here. And now I'm here. I used to be out there wondering. I was that kid with the camera longing and thinking, well, I, would I ever have a chance to walk in those doors or see what's inside that house? And the answer for kids like me, working class kids, you know, with limited access would be no, heck no, there's no way you're getting in that house. <laughs> because that house is, are for diplomats and wealthy people and people with privilege. And that's oftentimes how Washington works. You know, there's an expectation that certain people get invited to certain things. But those expectations never include those kids. So one of the things I thought, well, I'm, for the few little years we're in here, we're opening it up. We're opening it up to those kids because I want as many of them to walk through those doors and to experience what privileged people get to experience. So we had mentoring programs. And before state dinner, we would serve our mentees the food on the china with the dinner places set up. They would be our tasters. If ever we did a musical event, and we had some of the most amazing musicians come through the White House. Uh, Prince, Aretha Franklin, um, uh, you know, I can't even begin. Everybody came through the White House. And there was usually an evening event with fancy people and it was televised. Well, what we asked every performer to do was to come in earlier. And we would fly kids in with the help of some supporters and funders from all over the country. And they would get to spend the morning with those performers, just talking in the state room, just asking them all kinds of questions. And we often invited some of those kids to the performances. Um, and just to see the look on kids' faces, not just walking into the White House, but doing something in it, being a part of the White House, sitting on the chairs, eating the food, you know it's life-changing. And it means so much more than it does to that rich person who's been to the White House 10 times already. That one experience will change a life. And I guess selfishly, I enjoy that feeling of giving so many of those kids that feeling. Um, so that, that's why we did it. Well, you did an extraordinary job of giving not only those kids who were able to actually walk through the doors and experience it with you firsthand, but for the rest of us, because you did allow television cameras in. And so many of us were able to see what was going on and to feel as if we were a part of it, even though we were a part of it from afar. You also did an amazing job of just creating so many new experiences for lots of people, and we very much enjoyed watching that. But we also enjoyed watching your enjoyment of fashion. Oh, yeah. And, um, okay, I, fellas, we're gonna talk about shoes now. <laughs> Hold on, <laughs> just bear with us, okay? Well, we do have a fair number of people from Dress for Success oh, here yeah. in the audience. It's Wonderful. one of the organizations yeah. Women's Fund supports. <laughs> and we support Dress for Success because we know that every woman feels confident and assured when she's wearing something that she feels that she looks good in and that she's comfortable in. And so if she loves it, she can walk into a situation differently. And so we, we are happy to support Dress for Success. But will you tell us a little bit about how you felt about going out and looking good and creating those experiences for people and how that became such a statement for you to make, your fashion statement? Yeah, it's interesting because I never sought to make a fashion statement. I approach, I approach clothes like most women do. We want to look cute. That was my goal, to be cute. So it started there, and, and to be comfortable. Because here's the thing, um, what, I, what, what I came to, to learn about fashion, not in, as first lady, but just you know, in, engaging in the world, is that you're only as comfortable with people as you are with yourself. You know, so if, 
if I'm if I don't feel good and and I can move and do what I'm meant to do at that time, then I'm not. People are gonna sense that I'm all choked up, right? Because my my shoes hurt, or you know, my skirt's a little too tight, or you know, or I just don't like the way my you know back arm looks in that dress. You just you know, ladies, we're not happy, and then they people feel that, right? So for me, dressing well and dressing appropriate for whatever the activity was, because you know I did all kinds of things. I wasn't always at the state dinner or at a state dinner or greeting some diplomat. A lot of times I was on the floor with a bunch of kids, because that was what I told my staff: if you want to make me happy at any given point of the day, bring me the babies and let me be on the floor with them, you know. Or I'm running around with Shaq and some little kids, or doing some push-ups, or you know, doing something crazy out there just to get people moving. Um, what I wore was important. You know, I, did, I, I couldn't bend down to pick up a kid if I thought my shirt would be rising up in the back, right? You know, practical things. So that's why I tell women that fashion has to work for you. You know, you the fashion you should be working for fashion. You know, you shouldn't be tied to fads and trends and links and this and that because you should wear what works for your body at any given time because you'll feel good about yourself. And then if you feel good about yourself, you can freely connect with people, you know? I mean, I'm wearing these heels right now only because I don't have to walk across this rope line. But when I was doing rope lines and campaigning, I'd have a pair of flats on and we'd flip them off because I want to not focus on my feet. I want to focus on the person I'm interacting with. I want to give that hug. I don't want to have to worry about ripping something. I don't want to not be able to bend down and talk to a kid because my blouse is going to fall. That's distracting. That doesn't help you succeed. So, so the cameras were there and they saw me wearing whatever I wore. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, you're a fashion icon. And I was like, OK, whatever. <laughs> well, you moved right into the part very seamlessly, it seemed. No pun intended. So, <laughs> that was but, a good one. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so while we're talking about fashion, we, many of us, if not all of us, saw the unveiling of your official portrait oh, yes. yesterday. <laughs> and, And among other things, it's wonderful to now see African-American artists represented in the Smithsonian in this fashion. But I want to just read something that your husband said yesterday. What, did he, as he, what of the many things that he said yesterday? As he, <laughs> he thanked the artist and said, and I want to quote this, I want to thank you for so spectacularly capturing the grace and beauty and intelligence and charm and hotness oh, yeah. of the woman I love. <laughs> I actually don't have a question, but I just right. wanted to. He, he you know, said that. <laughs> wanted to say that if you're hearing that on a regular basis, you go, girl. Right. <laughs> So, speaking of your husband for just a moment, um, I suspect many people in the audience saw the film Southside with you. And um, you may not know this, but the part of your husband was actually played by an Indianapolis native whose oh, mother was okay. one of the founding mothers of Women's Fund. Oh, really? I did so not know that. We're very proud of the film. We're, we're also kind of thinking that we know just a little bit about your pre-public life with the man who would become your husband as a result of that film. But I'm curious about your public life when you were in the White House, you were the first lady, you were the first wife, you were the first mother, the first daughter, the first friend, all under the watchful eye of the general public. How did you do it all? And how did you do it as gracefully as you did to cause most of us to feel like it was just another day in the park for you? Well, it wasn't that easy. <laughs> But, but here's the thing, and I, I say to the, the people who think they want to go into politics or think they want to have a public life, um, you know, you can be a policy wonk, you can be smart as whatever, you can know all the answers, but in the end, you really have to like people, <laughs> you know, because the, these, are, these are people 
you know, jobs, you know, and if you're not comfortable, and I, I've seen politicians who are not comfortable with people, they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> and you're like, you must be miserable, you know, because you can feel them becoming somebody else right before your eyes, you know, because they don't feel comfortable in their skin with people. And that's something that Barack and I just, you know, we like people. We get energy from people. Now, we like our time with our family, and, you know, when you're with so many people, there are times you just, you know, I would just pass out in a chair somewhere um, and not really be able to move because I would be so exhausted. Um, but for me, it, it is easy for me. It was easy for me to be the first lady because every day I was with people. And that gave me energy. It gave me strength. It gave me purpose. And I didn't have to be anybody other than me. I was never trying to be the, a first lady that I read about somewhere. I, I entered into my life as an adult as me, and I say this again to young people. It's like you need to p pick careers and things that, that you want to do that allow you be, to be your authentic self. Because you, if you have to pretend to be somebody else, it is hard and uncomfortable to keep up with that falsehood. So I wasn't tired because I was Michelle Obama. I was that person then. <laughs> I, you know, for all the people who had sort of written these things down about us, about me, my husband, things I didn't even recognize, right? These people, it's like, how, well, who are these people you're talking about? I'd be afraid of them too if I knew who they were. You know, but when you know who you are, nobody can, nobody can take that from you. So that made the job for me easier because I just got up every day and if I greet you now the me that you see here is the me you will see backstage it will be the me that you'll see when I if I take a picture with you it's the me you'll see at home it's the me you'll hear about him with my friends I've just been able to be consistently me and I'm okay with that it's not perfect I make mistakes but I'm okay with who I am so that makes life in the public eye a, a little easier. Um, so I'm hearing you say that one of the things that's most important is for people to be themselves and to be comfortable in their own skin. And you talked about that in terms of public life. I, I'd like to turn for a moment to public service. Right now the, the climate is so brutal and so hostile and yet I think we need more and more women entering public service. What would you say to women and girls to encourage them to enter public service in spite of the climate and perhaps more importantly what would you say to them about how to change the climate well i'd be honest first of all and i you know a, a lot of people talk to me about running for office and ask this getting involved in public life and um you know i, I want to be honest with people and I hope there are a lot of people in this auditorium who are thinking about it because we do, we need good public servants all the time at all levels of the society. Um, but I tell them first, it's hard, you know, and, and you can't, it, again, you have to be a people person. You have to have knowledge. Please have some knowledge about something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It, it is really, really important. Um, it, is, it is hard on the people in your life. Um, public servants, you know, I, I don't care what political party you are. My whole feeling is, look, if you're willing to do this, you are, you are a good American. You are a good neighbor. You are a good, you know, because you even want to put yourself through it and your family through it. And this is true across the board. It's not an easy life. Um, so before you jump, you not gotta know that it's hard and know that it takes dedication and know that there's sacrifice, not just from you, but from the people who love you. Um, but then I would tell uh, any young woman to, to give it a go, you know, because we, we need diversity, we need strong female voices, we need people who bring different perspectives to the problems we're trying to solve. And it's, it's not because men are bad. We like you guys. 
but you just don't know everything. You haven't experienced everything. And I don't, I don't mean to be funny, it's just that we don't get to the right answers if the same people are at the table with the same experiences going, it looks good to you, it looks good to me, it looks good to you, what about you? Of course, you are all the same people. You don't, you don't know what I think or feel, you haven't lived in my shoes, and it's okay. But just be okay with the fact that y'all don't know everything. So get some other people in the room, you know? But that means that we have to have people ready to be in the room, you know? Um, and that's where, you know, all the potential women candidates come in, you know? Um, so start getting ready. Start educating yourself. Start learning about this democracy that you want to be a part of. Understand how it works, what its failings are, what its gifts are. Go to school. Please go to school. Um, and, and, and get involved now, you know? You don't have to, you know, and you don't have to just do politics. Politics is only one form of public service, and not everybody should be a politician. Um, but there, you, you can, you can, you can uh, volunteer. You, you can work on a campaign. You can work as a Senate staffer. You can be involved in the arena. There's so many different roles that people can play. But the only way you'll know about those roles, if you're educated and you experiment and you try some things, um, I would intern, you know, try to work in a campaign office, you know, find out about getting Senate internships, working in Washington, working in your state capital. There are tons of inter internships. We even have internships at our, our family office. So I want young women out there to start looking and exploring and trying some of that stuff out to see what fits in the public service arena. You have to try on some shoes before you know what you're comfortable in. And a lot of times we think that it just happens overnight, but a lot of times people who are in politics, they've been building towards this, they've been engaged and involved in small ways that you never see. It doesn't happen overnight. But we need, we need you out there. Um, so I hope many people begin to consider ways that they can uh, have an impact on our, our public discourse. So I couldn't agree with you more about the need to have more women in the room, more women at the table. And yet, at least in my experience, uh, once women get in the room, that doesn't necessarily mean that their voices will be heard. And oftentimes women have to work harder or differently in order to have their voices heard. Can you say a little bit about some of your experiences as you have had such an incredible career, you've worked in so many different fields. Um, what were some of your experiences when you got in the room? How did you ensure that your voice was in fact heard? I was loud and persistent. <laughs> Maybe not always loud, but persistent. Um, you know, everywhere I went, but, you know, when I was at a law firm, I immediately joined a recruitment team um, to recruit more law, law associates into the firm because I wanted to be at the table to discuss how we selected uh, folks. And what I found, for example, in my law firm is that people usually were comfortable choosing folks who went to the school they went to. And so the recruitment circle was kind of small. And for big corporate firms, they went to all the big schools. They went to Harvard, Yale, you know, they had five schools they'd go to. And then they'd look from those five schools and be like, there are no black people. And it's like, well, you, what about Howard? Howard has a law school. And there would some people would be like, what's Howard? You know, and he'd be like, okay, here we go. This is why you need me here, you know? <laughs> because half of y'all have never even heard of Howard's law school. The fact that there are some of the best and brightest African-American minds in those schools. Um, so being at the table was the, the, the start, but then I had to learn to not be afraid to disagree or to insert my opinion. And there were, there are a lot of people who get at the table and they're just too nervous because they're at the table. And so they don't really add that value because sometimes you get to the table and you're so worried about staying at the table, you don't want to lose your seat at the table. So you start talking like everybody else at the table, and now you're no good. You're wasting a seat. So, <laughs> and the truth is, is what I came to assume is that if this partner hired me, he knows I'm black, 
not hiding that, right? My assumption is there's a reason he hired me, because he, did, he didn't want to just hear himself. He wanted to hear another opinion. So I just assume you hired me. You must want to know what I think, and I got a lot of thoughts. Um, but that's part of that confidence that you build in yourself. If you're already telling yourself they don't want to hear me or maybe I'm not smart enough, and you're in a position where somebody has put you at the table exactly because they want to hear from you and you're quiet, you're going to eventually be, just become a non-factor because they're getting nothing from you. So it takes a little courage um, and it also takes being willing not to be at the table because maybe you say something that gets you kicked out of the table. Well, that means that's not a table you needed to be at, you know? So speak up and have the courage of your convictions and, and, and have the confidence in your experience, you know, the confidence that the life you've lived and what you've seen has value at the table. And a lot of times we don't think that because it goes back to those doubts we've had in our head. If we don't value ourselves, then we feel our, like our perspective and experiences don't have value and we don't add value. Um, but women have to be more, we, we have to be, a, a, we have to be a little pushy sometimes. And we have to be vocal and sometimes we have to disagree and we can't, you know, we have to take some risks. So that's what I did. I, I was really never afraid to take the risk. I was always kind of maybe even a little indignant about it. And you don't have to be indignant, but sometimes I get indignant. My mother would be like, were you being indignant? And I said, I think I was, Mom. Maybe I should go back in there with a different strategy. Um. <laughs> well, clearly that strategy worked for you. So I'd like to talk a little bit about women who perhaps had a, have a slightly different background than you did. You've talked about the support you had, the loving family from which you came, the neighborhood support. Well, Women's Fund supports a number of women who are living in poverty, who are living with food insecurity, who are living with mental health issues, who are just working every single day to overcome these and so many other obstacles. What would you say to them about how to go high when they can barely make it from day to day, and when sometimes they don't even have role models around them who know what the high road is? That's a good question. You know, there's only so much you can say to folks when you know their opportunities are at zero, you know? And for me, sometimes it feels like a waste to go to somebody who, you know, is living in poverty and is you know, doesn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. There are the typical things you say, just keep it going, stay positive, thank the Lord, pray, whatever. But uh, the better use of my time is trying to fix those problems that they're facing. You know, not spend the energy trying to pump up people who, who don't have options when we need to be doing the work to change those circumstances. You know, that's one of the reasons why you know, I've, I've worked on education issues um, because we have to fix it so that all kids have really good opportunities to get through decent high schools and have a chance at college or something beyond high school, that they get that training. You know, you can't just ask people to live on platitudes and on well wishes. You know, that's why we have a social safety net in this country. That's why we have welfare, that's why we have school grants and Pell grants, because sometimes people need a hand up, and it's not enough to tell them that, you know, again, you can't pull yourself up by bootstraps if you don't have boots. We say that all the time. So it, it doesn't make sense to ask people to make something out of nothing when most of us who are successful have something. You don't make something out of nothing. So we have to do that work to realize that, you know, First of all, if people are in a bad situation, it's not because they want to be there. It's, they're not, it's not because somebody is lazy or just hasn't tried. There are people who were born into circumstances that we can't even imagine. They are dealing with pain and loss and grief and post-trauma. Um, they are fighting against things we can never imagine. And still many of them rise above that and do succeed. 
But we live in a society where we have the resources. We do. There are, there's enough of us doing well nowadays to be able to reach down and figure out a way to make sure that all schools are good and solid, you know, and competitive, that everybody has health care. I'm sorry. You know, that everybody can go to a doctor when they're sick. We have enough that everybody has a place to lay their head that we don't have homeless veterans. But, you know, you can't look at a vet on the street and just give him a coin and go, just hang in there. You know, we, we have to do the work. And some of that work is political, you know. Some of that work, is, it's not just in your church. It's not just, you know, in your heart. You know, there are, there, there, there are politics behind that work. There are decisions and choices that we make as a society about where we're going to put our resources and how we're going to help people when they're down, not just when there's a hurricane or a storm, you know, but when, you know, people just can't make it through life because they haven't been set up to succeed at all. We, we have the ability to be that nation for everyone in this nation and to help around the world. We are strong enough to do both. So I'd rather spend the time working on those solutions than because I don't know what you say to somebody. I really don't. If I'm honest with you, I don't know what you say to somebody, to a kid who has been born into a, a bad neighborhood where guns are there and no jobs and their school is crappy and they know it. Because let me tell you something, kids know when they're not being invested in. They know it. I I've, I've, I've grew up with some of those kids. I barely missed some of those classrooms where kids knew that nobody cared, that the teacher didn't care, that you know, people didn't, didn't care whether they were reading or having homework from what, kids know that. And when you grow up knowing that nobody cares about you, you grow up as a baby knowing that no one cares about you. What am I gonna say to that kid when he's 18? You know, what, what words do you offer somebody, you know? And now they're in jail and you wonder why? You know, we got to start early. We got to start fixing this stuff early and then we don't have to worry about platitudes and what you tell people when it's hard. How true. Thank you for that. You mentioned health care and I'd like to ask you about mental health because um, as some may have seen in the video earlier, the Women's Fund is involved in the campaign to change direction. We share your interest in mental wellness and we think it's important for people to know the five signs of emotional mm -hmm. distress and to be able to recognize them in themselves and in others and perhaps more importantly what to do when they see them. But I'm curious as to why you believe it's so important to change the way people really think about mental illness. Well my, my first exposure to the campaign to change direction was through my work with joining forces and which I urge every American, if you have never found time to spend time in a military community, you know, whether it's on a base or in a community where there's a high number of military families, do so. Because it, cha it will change the way you think about our defense, about our, our country, about sacrifice. You know, that's another reason why I got through being First Lady very easily, because I knew military spouses, you know, and that's service. What I was doing was living in a nice house and my husband, you know, had a hard job, but, you know, they were serving. Um, but what you learn when you're in a military community is that there are many people who are dealing with a whole range of mental health illnesses, oftentimes brought about by battle, post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury. Um, and there's no reason to be ashamed of something that happened to you because you were serving and protecting our country. But sadly, we live in a society where mental health is stigmatized because we just don't know, we, we don't know as much as, we didn't know as much back then as we know now about how the brain functions, right? I mean, we grew up sort of thinking mental health is somehow separate from your whole physical being. Well, your brain is an organ like your heart and your liver are organs. And everybody is born with different kind of brains that react differently to stress and violence and trauma or there's some genetic defect it's not it's like being mad at somebody because they've got a bad heart um, but we didn't know all that 50 years ago a hundred years ago so we've sort of been socialized to think well if somebody is schizophrenic or they're depressed or um, you know 
if they're dealing with any number of, of mental health issues, that somehow they're broken, as opposed to, no, they need a doctor. <laughs> uh, that's, not, that's not a bad thing. It's no worse needing psych psychological health or medicine to help you with whatever your symptoms are as it is to take cholesterol medicine. But we just haven't really figured that out yet. We haven't sort of kept up with the science and the learning and the knowledge. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I thought it was important because I thought, well, maybe if, if the average American could see that our strongest, the strongest people in our society are men and women serving, we're struggling and dealing with these issues, they're our heroes, they're protecting us, that if we could destigmatize it for them, then, then that would spread to the rest of us. That would help that 16-year-old girl who's thinking about killing herself because there's something going on. She's hearing voices or something happened or she inherited uh, a mental health issue from her great-grandmother. You know, maybe that soldier can help that little girl and help us understand. So understanding the five signs is like knowing CPR, right? It's knowing how to help somebody who's, and we teach that, right? But we should be teaching that when it comes to this brain, this organ, and not just this one. So I thought that the campaign was like a basic way to start just um, making mental health uh, have, be, be given the same level of respect and care <laughs> as any other health issue that we face. So, but I think it's a, a great campaign. Well, thank you for bringing attention to mental wellness uh, because from this position you've held, when you make comments such as you've just made, it makes a huge difference for people. And I think that's particularly true in the African American community and in other minority communities and with respect to women who need to feel as if it's okay for them to talk about their mental health issues. And so we very much appreciate your raising that awareness. I also think that, um, you, and you mentioned this a little bit, when you strengthen the community, whether that's through helping people to be well physically and mentally, or through strengthening the people in the community, and particularly women, you strengthen the entire community in, in a way that permeates everything mm -hmm. that's done. But in order to really strengthen women, they have to be empowered economically. And we know that there are statistics that show that women are paid less mm -hmm. for the same or civil, similar work than men are doing. And then, of course, there are the women who are not even in the professional workforce. Mm -hmm. how, how would you suggest we try to lead those women to economic empowerment? And what else would you suggest that we think about doing just to ensure that women are, are empowered economically? Well, there's the politics of the work. It's making sure that we elect people who believe in fair pay and equal pay and who um, are looking at po policies that look to bridge some of those gaps. So there's the politics of it. Um, I think there is internal work that we have to do as women um, to get to the point where we feel like we deserve equal pay, and I, I still think, honestly, we as women struggle with advocating for ourselves. You know, we're, we're socialized to put ourselves third, fourth, last on our lists, and it's, it's no surprise. I mean, every woman who hears me say that will shake their head and say, yep, yep, I, I always think about myself last. You know, it's my kids first, my, my partner, or my parent, or my girlfriends. Um, and I put myself last. And the more we do that and say that to ourselves, the harder it is to ask for more for us. You know, we just don't feel like we deserve it. And then to have that piled on with whatever message you're hearing out there in the world or in, in your own family, the sort of misogyny that we hear, all that serves to just sort of reinforce those negative feelings that we have, and it keeps us from, for, from advocating for ourselves. And I don't know that we can look outside of us as women to figure that out. I think we have to have some conversations among ourselves, you know, without the guys in the room, you know, with people that we trust, other women that we trust, so that we can be honest and start breaking down some of those fears and those things that keep us back. What did we hear when we were growing up? What happened to us? What was that trauma that, that, that got us to this place? 
and figure out where that's coming from. I mean, I thought about it after this election as so many women voted for a candidate who wasn't supportive of any, many of the issues that would support them. And, and that's, you know, that, to me, that's like, what, what, what's going on with us? You know, that's really, what, 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 what is happening to us? that we would just hand our power away like that. And I, I, again, I don't think that's men's problems, that you guys are probably the cause of a lot of it. I don't know. Um, but, <laughs> but we've got to tap into that place in us and figure out what's going on. Um, and then we have to be brave, you know, and be courageous and step up and, and fight for this stuff. Um, you know, the women who are in power and have leverage and who have seats at the table, we have to ask ourselves, are we really pushing hard? Are we using those seats to make changes for the women who can't? Or are we comfortable in our places? Are we afraid to lose ground? Um, we gotta kinda be honest about that because right now, without the changes, the advocates are the women who are holding the seats and there are plenty of us who do. There are women now in all, leadership positions in every sector. We are CEOs, we are mayors, we are governors in some instances. Um, we run our households, we make the decisions in, in, in healthcare. We, we're the ones who do all the work. Um, we're in academia, we are tenured faculty, we are physicians, we're lawyers, we're partners at firms. We're everywhere right now. We are rabbis and priests and we're, we're everywhere. But if we're everywhere being quiet, if we're everywhere being afraid, if we're everywhere holding on to what we have, worrying about losing something, then there, there's your answer. Then we're not really fighting and using the leverage that we have. So I'd, I'd like to ask you to get just a little bit more specific. Oh goodness. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> Um, as you said, most women have, have been in that seat where they have felt that they might not be good enough or whatever, and have worked hard to have their voice heard. But when it comes to advocating for themselves, yeah. it's hard. It is. It's hard. And you know the names that we're called when we do it. And mm -hmm. we don't like being called those names. And so we sometimes are very reticent about ad advocating for ourselves. How did you advocate for yourself? And especially while you were in the White House, and there were probably lots of people trying to tell you what to do and how to do mm -hmm. it, how did you advocate for you and what you cared most about? Not just in the White House, but leading up to the White House. Well, it, it, you know, just like, look, in politics, <laughs> the, the spouse, which is usually the woman, <laughs> is, is, it can be marginalized in so many ways, because that's just the way the system works. Everybody's like running behind the candidate. It's like you're just eating dust, you know. Um, but, you know, I, what I learned was that I had to, first of all, I had to make, my, make sure that I was an asset, right? Um, so I had to make sure that if I did anything, that I did, whatever I did added value to the enterprise. So that just like in the workplace, you just can't be at the table sitting there, you gotta be at the table being relevant. Um, so I tried to be very relevant in terms of, you know, being out there, campaigning, um, advocating, being articulate, doing whatever it was, drawing crowds, getting people enthusiastic, being passionate, um, and being organized and strategic. And the more I found that people were realizing I was an asset, the more I saw my leverage and the more I used it to advocate for the things I needed and the things I wanted to see happen in the campaign. And I just use that example is that you take that all the way into being first lady and if you've got to know how to advocate for yourself because the first lady isn't paid, we don't have a ton of staff, but there's sort of an interesting expectation-ish that people have of you. If you do too much, then they're mad because you're not elected, but if you don't do enough, then why are you there? Um, so it's an odd sort of position to be in as the country is trying to figure out, well, what does it mean to be the first lady or the first spouse or whatever that may be? But 
I found that I had to advocate for resources and for um, the support I needed, you know, for communication strategy. I had to advocate just like I did when I was working in the law firm or running a nonprofit organization. It's a, and even though this was my husband's administration and he supported me in everything I did, he was busy. You know, so if you, you know, so I guess what I'm saying is that I didn't do anything differently than I'm sort of telling people to do, women to do in, in their respective roles. I, I was advocating every day as First Lady, not to anybody outside, but just within that organizational structure, because I thought, I, I bring value to this. Shoot, I'm responsible for some of those approval ratings. So there are things that I need to make this work for me. So. I was very clear about the boundaries, too, that I needed. This is also something I think women, we don't do well for ourselves, is creating boundaries within which we want to work. Um, what I said when I campaigned was that I will, because I was, when we first started, uh, I was still working. I was a senior vice president at the hospital, and I, I had two kids. He did, too, but I really had them. <laughs> so. I was still taking kids to soccer practice and going to birthday parties and, you know, we were keeping them on their schedule and by the, the kids were little then, so you know, there was a birthday party every weekend. <laughs> I mean, I don't remember having that many birthday parties when I was little, but these kids celebrate birthdays now. So you're trying to keep the boat floating and keeping things normal. I was going to work, trying to pretend like my husband wasn't running for president and sitting at a table and negotiating like, hey, yeah, no, let's get to this point. Um, but I had to get to the point where I told the campaign, I will give you three days and you can, you can fill up my plate for those three days. And I would get up at 5.30 in the morning, go get my hair done, ladies, because you got to get your hair done before you go out campaign get on a plane, fly to Iowa, spend like from 10 in the morning until 6 at night, get on the last plane out, get home in time to have dinner with the girls right before they went to bed, and I'd get up and go to work the next day. But I only did that three days a week. And then when those three days were over, I was like, don't call me, don't look at me, don't mention my name. I'm not even turning on the TV. I don't care what he's doing. I don't care. It's not one of those three days. <laughs> and people learn to respect those boundaries. And I carried some of those boundaries, that strategy, my willingness to advocate for myself into the White House. And that made my life a little bit easier. And I think it allowed me to, to accomplish as much as we were able to accomplish. Which was, which was quite a lot. And needless to say, it was quite a lot. So speaking of boundaries, we are nearing the end of our conversation, and I so regret that our time is almost over. So short. It seems very short. Now, you do this all the time. This is not my average Tuesday night. <laughs> and so I'm amazed at how quickly the time has flown by. But before we end our conversation, I would like to ask one last question. And that is, what would you like to say to each person in this room and especially to the women and the men, I'm sorry, the women and the girls in this room, about what oh, each of us- like, Again, oh, left well, out. Well, it's okay. <laughs> they, they'll survive, <laughs> they'll survive. <laughs> but what would you like to say to each of us about what we can go out and do right now that would make a difference? Mm, yeah, well, first of all, I wanna thank everyone. It means so much for people to take their time on a Tuesday night to come out and stand in line and sit and wait just to hear me talk it you know it I I feel honored and humbled every time I do these uh, conversations um, but here's what I'd say is first of all vote okay and again this isn't about party truly it isn't you know, I think an active, engaged, intelligent, informed electorate helps us all. Whether you agree with me or him or not, it, it's so important. Um, that's what you can do right now to, today, you know. And, and don't just vote every four years. I mean, vote for everything there is to vote for. Dog catcher, city council, you know, garbage pickup guy. <laughs> 
every office it matters. The government is structured like that. <laughs> All these positions affect your lives. And if, if what I tell young people is that if you don't vote, you are essentially letting your grandmother choose the country you will live in. And we love grandma, but you wouldn't even let your grandma pick out a pair of shoes for you. <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta engage because the people who vote will dictate the country you live in, you know? And like I said, love grandma, but she may have a different set of needs for the country she wants that are different from yours. Yours won't be heard. So voting is something that you can do and you can change lots of stuff with voting. Um, but here's the most important thing, particularly in this time that we absolutely have control over. It's our own individual actions each and every day. You know, waking up every day and being a decent person, <laughs> being kind and open and generous and compassionate, showing empathy for others, just trying to figure out what's happening in the other person's shoes, assume the best in your neighbors, not the worst. Don't assume that you should be afraid of me, <laughs> you know? Assume that you have nothing to fear from me because I'm just a person trying to do the same thing. If we give each other the benefit of the doubt every single day, you know, even when you don't agree with them, I mean, Barack says this all the time, and it's hard to do when you're up against people who are just trying to stop you from doing anything, but you still have to kind of figure out why, what's going on in their world, what is, what's their challenge, what are their fears, because nine times out of ten, we're, we're trying to do the same thing. I don't care what color skin we are, I don't care what state we live in, I don't care who, where our parents were born. Most Americans, what I've learned, everybody is waking up every day just trying to get by. They want to go to work, they want to send their kids to college, they don't want crime, they don't want anybody hurt, they just want a fair shake. That's true for everyone. And if we just believe that basic decency in ourselves and we act in that way, that we, we, we act on that generosity, you know, in our politics, in, 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 in our church, in our schools, that's powerful. That is a powerful thing that each and every one of us can do right now today, is to act with decency and with some compassion and being open-minded and open-hearted. And nobody can take that from you if you do that every day. Well, Mrs. Obama, our time has indeed come to an end, and I just want to thank you once again for being here this evening, for once again sharing with us extraordinary words of wisdom and inspiring us as you have. You will always be a leader in our eyes and a leader in our country. And we appreciate that more than we can thank say. Thank you, thank so you, Alicia. Thank you. you all, thank you. Thank you, guys. This was fun. Bye.